So the mouse is here for so everything is visible both to the hall and to the Zoom people. Right. And I guess our height is similar so they can see you. If they can't see you. Right, okay. So that, that's yeah. how I will adjust that. I'm quite yeah. used to doing Zoom. So okay. One of the speakers was so How tall. many people are there? Uh, not very many. One, two, two people. Okay. Well, well, it's still there in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, David will introduce you. David, do you want to? David is from UNA Westminster. We had lunch together, so I've, I've spoken a little bit to him. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say enough, but I was, I, I, was, I was having the pleasure of meeting you and now we're talking to you. I feel I know you a bit, which is always nice. So, uh, it's all set up. So what do I do? Sorry. So, if you, all you have to do is introduce the speaker number, uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Paul will do it himself. I don't have to touch it. No. Okay. Uh, as long as they can see yeah, your height. I yes. could see him in there. I could make sure I can be seen. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, introduce the second speaker, and then I'll start the recording. Yes. Uh, there's no Q and A after Paul. I, I get out of the way. Yes. That would be you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay. 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 I spoke to um, John Lott and. Uh, yeah. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We will start our final session, session three. There are two speakers. Uh, Professor Paul Eakins is here. Uh, the second speaker, uh, Professor Sir Dieter Helm, has sent his recording, so we will put the recording on. And after that, we will have a panel discussion where Professor Eakins and John, if you're still here, will have a panel discussion. Um, chaired by Tricia, uh, chair of UNA Laser, and then a little bit of business meeting, and that will end a bit early. So, uh, David. Well, hello, everybody. Um, what a fascinating two sessions we've had. Um, I feel in myself that we've been looking at some of the pieces in the great jigsaw puzzle we all have to put together. And there's a need to stand back and look at the big picture, how to even find the big picture. And who are the communicators who are going to help us do this? Linking phenom phenomena, um, consequences, and advising on the action that we should take. Who are the people who can help us out narrate the deniers? So I'm privileged to introduce two of those people. And firstly, I'm introducing Professor Paul Eakins, Professor of Resources at Environment Policy, University College London. He received the UN Environment Protection's Global 500 Award for Outstanding Environmental Achievement and the OBE for Services to Environmental Policy. So the question is, can we hope for green growth through decisive climate action? Economists disagree as to whether the net zero transition will be very expensive or whether it could trigger a new cycle of economic growth and prosperity. This talk will explore the evidence for both viewpoints and set out the conditions through which green growth could be achievable. Paul, you have three days, <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> No, well, you certainly wouldn't be here for three days. So um, uh, thank you very much, David, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, love, I love coming to events like this because it's so nice being with people who would much rather understand 
the very difficult world in which we now live and watch Wimbledon. It's, it's fantastic that we have that level of commitment still in our communities because we're going to need it. Um, so sustainable green growth, and I've put for the UK, <clears throat> we may find in the panel session afterwards, and I'm delighted that John's going to be here for that, that we might like to apply some of, these, some of this thinking to uh, the rest of the world. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Most of what I've got to say will apply to the UK. Um, if you feel you want to interrupt me, please do. If there's a point that flashes up there which you feel you want some further clarification on, that's fine. And I guess if at the end there are one or two questions of clarification before we go into Dieter Helm's recording, uh, that would also be fine. Um, I suggested that we took the questions for this, these two speeches together because I have a rather different view to Dieter's about some of these things. And therefore, his recording, I've no idea what he's going to say, but I do read his podcasts because he's an influential figure in my world. Um, it may be that, that, uh, that he says things that are slightly different to what I've said, and you'd ask me to explore some of those differences uh, in, the, in the panel session. So, what is this thing? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm an academic. I like to define terms. Um, when we start, what is this sustainable growth? And I'm uh, not a young man, and I remember very clearly thinking about these economic things back in the 1970s. And of course, chancellors would talk the whole time about sustainable growth in the 1970s, but it didn't mean anything to do with the environment at all. It was entirely about inflation and balance of payments and. Uh, public sector spending and borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, it means something slightly different now in this talk because I'm an environmentalist before an economist, and I became an economist because I wanted to understand why it was that our economy is so systematically destructive of the world in which we live. I think I do now understand that, and I'm going to try to share some of that. The next question, which is, of course, the big important one, is what do we do about it? And that's why I'm a professor of policy, because I'm particularly interested in answers to that question. So economic growth that is sustainable will maintain environmental functions. Now, that's a rather <clears throat> inelegant phrase. But we have to think, what is it the natural world does for us? And in the academic literature, we can find basically these four sets of environmental functions. It gives us resources, both renewable and non-renewable. It absorbs wastes, and its ability to absorb waste is phenomenal. I mean, we are way beyond its ability to absorb our wastes, both in terms of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in terms of plastic in the oceans, and a whole heap of other things. But actually, it's pretty good at absorbing waste if we were to keep within what you heard earlier, the planetary boundaries, the safe operating space. It maintains the biosphere, and the biosphere is a pretty special thing. We know a lot about other planets, galaxies, everything out there, and we've never found anything like this, and that's pretty special. And unfortunately, we're trashing it just about as quickly as we possibly could. And it contributes in numerous ways to human health and welfare. And it was fascinating during COVID, lots of people talking about it as if they discovered nature for the first time. You know, they would go out for their daily walk in the park, which they were allowed to do at springtime. And you wondered where they'd been for the last 30 years. Um, that, that it's taken them all that time to discover that actually there's a world out there that uh, is pretty good. So, but economic growth also has to maintain social co cohesion. There are obviously issues to do with unemployment, cost of living, inequality that we're very familiar with. And if society falls apart, all the evidence suggests is that it treats the planet worse and not better. And we've got to manage the economy effectively. And that's what I said right at the beginning, that the chancellors would be talking about sustainable growth and they'd be talking about inflation, public borrowing, balance of payments. And as we know, those issues now have a salience in our own 
economy, which they have not had for the last 20 or 30 years. So all those aspects of sustainable growth are important. So that's the growth thing. This is the climate change thing. This comes from the IPCC's 1.5 degree report and the uh, graphs on your right, your left, uh, are all the IPCC scenarios of decarbonization. So those rapidly reducing lines, blue lines, uh, are greenhouse gas emissions, and that's what they've got to do if we are to keep average global temperatures to within the 1.5 degree Paris target. We've never come anywhere near doing anything like that. So the challenge uh, is simply monstrous of bringing that down. And you'll notice, or you would if it was more legible, that this is the zero emission line here. Ah, that was not a good thing to do. This is the zero emission line here. So that from about mid-century, if we want to keep to within 1.5 degrees, not only are we not emitting into the atmosphere, we're actually sucking very large quantities of carbon out of the atmosphere, which we've put into the atmosphere in the last 30 years because we've done effectively nothing over the last 30 years since the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992. We've done effectively nothing to reduce emissions globally. Individual countries have done a little, but uh, globally, not really. And um, <clears throat> that ties in very much with what uh, James was talking about before, about the role of agriculture, because agriculture at the moment is a gross net emitter, as he said, and it has to become a gross net sink. And if we look at the numbers here, so this is naught, this is minus 10, and you can see that lots of those scenarios are looking at the minus 10 line by shortly after 2050. Minus 10 what? Minus 10 billion tons of CO2 equivalents every year. That is a gobsmackingly large number that it's almost impossible for us to imagine. So it's hard to overestimate the nature of the challenge. However, although I've said we've done precious little over the last 30 years uh, in terms of reducing emissions and concentrations, and the graph I haven't shown here, but which is really depressing, shows that concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have grown by about two parts per million every year since then, without any, without the slightest blip. Um, with the possible exception of the, COVID, um, of the COVID pandemic, which was hardly a result of policy. Um, so we've not had any real impact on the indicator that matters, which is the concentration of this, these gases in the atmosphere. We have learned quite a lot about what we need to do. And that's why it's been an incredibly you know, professionally rewarding place for me to be, because we really do understand now what we need to do in order to make the difference that we need to make. There's lots of opportunities for zero cost mitigation. So what do I mean by that? Well, you, those of you who spend your lives reading newspapers may know that a couple of days ago, the government had its, the UK government had its latest uh, call for bids for producing offshore wind power. And those came in at a number of 37 pounds per megawatt hour, which is about half the current cost of gas fired electricity. So offshore wind is now really cheap. Onshore wind is even cheaper, but um, uh, for various reasons, we don't like it in this country because we think it spoils the countryside. And, and I respect people who think that because the last thing I want to do is trash the countryside. I mean, that's part of the nature, that's part of our natural heritage. I actually don't agree that it spoils them, and aesthetics, as we know, is in the eye of the beholder. But nevertheless, it's a view I respect. But no, I, 
obviously the offshore stuff is much less um, contentious in that respect, and it is now very cheap. So that's the second bullet point. The third bullet point is just as important, which is that our experience is that with these new technologies, if we roll them out at scale, they come down in cost in a dramatic sort of way. So the first of those auctions for offshore wind, which took place in about 2006, was not so long ago. The cost there was 150 pounds per megawatt hour, and it's now 37 and a half, which is pretty dramatic. And the only reason that has happened is because we, in the intervening period, we built quite a lot of these things. And we've learned how to do it better with all sorts of innovative technologies. Then there's the whole subject of resource efficiency. The fact that we dig out vast quantities of stuff from the earth, we process it into products, and then we throw them away very, very quickly. And I think the numbers are something like that about half of all the materials that come into an economy like the UK are already waste within six months. And it goes either into holes in the ground or it goes into an incinerator or even worse, it goes into a container and gets shipped off to some country which says it's going to recycle it and it ends up heaven knows where. That's not a very intelligent way of proceeding. And if we designed our economic system differently, that is not what we would do with these materials. So that's another lecture. I'm not gonna talk much about the circular economy, but that's what I mean. I mean about us keeping materials in circulation, more or less indefinitely, for as long as they can, and then managing them at their ends of life in a way that doesn't impact on the environment. And I guess the last of those bullet points on that slide is, um, is a really interesting one, because we all think we know what the word cost means. And when someone says to you, this is expensive, you kind of know what it means. But actually, cost can mean lots of different things. The difference between a consumer cost where you buy something, effectively use it up and throw it away, and between an investment cost where you do something, it's an expenditure, but it enables you to be productive in the future, it's completely different. It's economically a completely different category. And yet they are both costs. And this is really important because there is currently on the right wing of the Conservative Party, a group of members of parliament who are calling themselves the net zero scrutiny group. And they are attacking UK climate policy on the grounds of cost because they completely fail to understand the difference between cost as consumer expenditure and cost as investment. And I'll come back to that point uh, later on. Now, if we're going to think about sustainable growth, we have to think, well, where does economic growth come from? Which is, a, in a way, a funny thing for us to have to think about because all of us have never known anything else. Uh, you know, things have gone up and down. Sometimes humans are exceptionally stupid and they managed to stop the economic growth process. We, we did that with the financial crash in 2008 or nine. Uh, COVID did it for us um, just recently. But actually this is a very, very special time in human existence. Economic growth has not been the normal experience of human societies. It is in these last 200 years that we have known economic growth since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And we actually understand pretty well now where it comes from. 
And it comes from obviously population growth, the labor supply increases, up goes economic output, and there's a lot more people than there used to be. Much more important in terms of economic output per person, which obviously then abstracts from the population growth, is investment. And all the economic growth models have investment there. At the heart of it, if you increase the capital stock, just as I was saying, you're putting money aside, you're building things that will deliver in the future, not just for today. And then we have technical progress. And that's the real motor of economic growth. We manage to find ways of turning non-resources into resources. So think of fossil fuels. They've existed for millions of years, but they only became a resource about 200 years ago. They were always there, but we didn't know what to do with them. Think of silicon. Sand, one of the most common elements on the planet. That's existed ever since when, but it was only 60 years ago that we, that we learned how to turn them into transistors and the digital revolution that has followed with that. So we turn non-resources into resources. We learn to do things better, you, as we all know in our own limited way with our DIY skills. And similarly with this offshore wind stuff, how is it that the cost of offshore wind has come down from 150 to 37 and a half pounds a megawatt hour? It's simply that these guys have learned how to do this thing, how to do it properly in hostile environments. It's difficult to build these turbines uh, in the North Sea. And decarbonization, getting fossil fuels out of the system will only reduce economic growth if Zero carbon energy is more expensive than fossil fuels. Well, I mean, look at the cost of fossil fuels now. Those costs will come down. The price of fossil fuels will definitely come down in the future. But at the moment, renewables are an absolute no-brainer in any country in the world. And my big hope from this awful cost of living increase that we're seeing, which is uh, proving so challenging to many people, is that it will give renewables that extra push uh, to take it forward so that those costs come down even further so that when the oil price and the gas price fall, which they will, they, are, they remain competitive. Then there's the possibility that decarbonization will slow technical progress. I think it's almost certainly to be the opposite. It will actually accelerate technical progress because people will be looking for new ways of doing things with new different resources. And humans are pretty smart technologically in that kind of way. And, and then there's the third issue, which is an important one. It's the focus of my own research activity at the moment, which is that these new technologies use parts of the scientific periodic table, which we didn't used to use in very great quantities. And we've got to dig, find these things and dig them up. And we better do it in a way that is much less environmentally destructive than the mining industry has operated in to date. So that's going to be a challenge. I don't think it's a geological challenge. The earth has plenty of these materials, but it's going to be a geopolitical challenge because at the moment, Russia and China own and refine well over 50% of the global supply of most of these minerals. And as we know, that is not a resilient way to plan your future. So, no room for complacency there, but also absolutely no room for despair. So this graph here comes from a piece of modeling that we did. I don't have time to explain it in a great deal of detail. But uh, what it basically shows is what I take to be the big challenge of the transition. So the black bars are the share of GDP in investment. And the two the orange and yellow bars are the share of GDP in consumption. And for those, most of you will probably not be economists, but GDP is calculated by adding what we spend on consumption with what we spend on investment. And then there's an item for net export. So if we consume something, we don't invest it. And if we invest it, we don't consume it. Because the economy can only produce so much. And we have to decide the balance between those two. And in order to get through the low carbon transition, we are going to have to increase our share of investment. 
The line you see there shows gross world product, GWP, and you can see that that is still going up. So we will be richer, and those that's based on assumptions that we continue to invest and that we continue to have technical progress, but we're going to have to invest more. And that is a bit of a challenge for a society that thinks of itself as a consumer society. In Victorian times, when we were much poorer than we are now, we saved about 40% of our GDP. So our balance was 40% saving and investment, 60% consumption. Those of you who've read the novels of Charles Dickens will know there were lots of poor people around at that time, but we chose to invest rather than to consume. In China at the moment, they invest about 30% of their GDP and consume about 70%. It used to be 40 over the first decade and a half of this century. In the UK at the moment, we invest between five and 10% of our GDP and consume 90 to 95% of it. That balance has got to change. And we have somehow to create the macroeconomic conditions that more people will invest at the cost of consumption. And that is something that is likely not to be politically popular especially as a lot of the things that people consume are very carbon intensive and that they enjoy consuming. We love eating meat. We love flying to exotic places, either on holiday or because our family lives there. We love driving cars. All those things are the things that really create the carbon emissions. And for some of them, there are very few substitutes, low carbon substitutes in prospect. Um, but if we do that investment, all the evidence suggests that the effect on our incomes, on GDP, because that's what GDP measures, it's a measure of our incomes, will be very small. So what this graph again comes from the IPCC um, uh, data, the scenarios, there's just a few scenarios there. The solid lines are their baseline scenarios that show the economy is growing in the absence of reducing carbon emissions. And those lines are obviously wrong because if we don't reduce carbon emissions, we will get huge reductions in our GDP. You saw all the pictures that John showed us. That, those damages are really bad. I mean, I think you gave some numbers in Grenada about the, the, the economic destructiveness of these events. So one of my little campaigns academically at the moment is to stop economic modelers producing baselines that show economies without climate change mitigation, just going on, growing off into the future, because they won't. They absolutely will not do that. But even if you assume that they will, and you then say, well, let's spend all the money that we need to spend on these investments to get fossil fuels out of the system, you can see the dotted lines. The dotted lines show that economic growth is less fast, but they also show that the effect is very small. And these are the investments that would keep the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, because that's what these scenarios do. I mean, they meet the Paris target. So they transform the economy entirely away from fossil fuels towards low carbon. Okay, so um, I think we can, I've jumped a slide, but I think we can move to the conclusions now. And um, my conclusion is that actually the GDP costs of mitigation are relatively low and economists like to express those in terms of percentages of GDP. And those kinds of numbers are very, very often misinterpreted as meaning that we will be one to 4% poorer than we are now. But from the previous graph, 
What they actually are saying is that you're one to 4% poorer than you would be in the absence of these mitigating things in the context of a growing economy. So that by 2100, the economy might only be four times its current size instead of five times its current size at whatever, except that would be a, obviously a 20% reduction in GDP. So we would still be much richer. We would be consuming less as a share of that wealth because we're having to invest more. And we would be consuming very, very differently because the things that damage the planet will need to be much, much more expensive. And that's the whole argument about carbon pricing and greenhouse gas emission pricing and pricing other kinds of environmental effects. And then the second two bullet points, that these costs of one to 4%, I mean, is much less than we spend on all sorts of other things in our economy health and education for a start. And I haven't yet talked about the really big damaging effects of fossil fuels, which is not, not necessarily climate change, but today is the damage of local air pollution. And uh, when I was co-editing the United Nations Environment Programme's book on uh, the global environment outlook, the number that just sticks in my head is that air pollution kills four to seven million people every year. As many as COVID. Year on year, year on year happens just like that because we use fossil fuels. And of course, low carbon doesn't do that. So in addition to sorting out climate change, we get these benefits. And if you stick those numbers into models, then actually these mitigations are an unequivocal benefit for human societies. Fossil fuel importing countries, of course, have an even bigger benefit because instead of buying fossil fuels from other countries, they're using their own energy resources. And that's been thrown into sharp relief with the Ukraine war uh, just recently, because obviously we now have to stop buying from one of the world's big fossil fuel exporters, Russia. And um, uh, obviously, the quicker we can become dependent on our own renewable energy resources, the better. So we would get these energy security benefits. And these investments that we're making, as we're discovering in the Northeast, where a lot of these offshore wind turbines are now being built, on the infrastructure that was built during the Industrial Revolution and subsequently, uh, is a huge driver of regeneration and development in those areas. And then there's the big but. And unfortunately, the big but is where we're actually going. That if we don't do this mitigation stuff, if we don't get away from fossil fuels, and not over the next 30 years, but over the next 10, having done very little in the last 30 years, then we'll find really big hits on GDP, especially in places like Grenada, which John was talking about so eloquently earlier on. So it's an economic opportunity. It's an investment, not a cost. And it's an absolute imperative for human society in the future. Thank you. By all means. Going back to your graphs, where do public services fit? Uh, well, very much on the public consumption. So here is the public services, this little orange block. And you can see that they're growing too. And they're probably almost certainly growing because human society is getting older uh, by the time we get to 2100. Population growth more or less stops in 2050, uh, according to the United Nations. So we reach 9.5 or 10 billion or however many it is. And at that point, if we continue getting richer, people will live longer and public services will increase. So that's, uh, that's probably where that's coming from. But does it, does it 
make a judgment about the value of those services as opposed to the value of these are all possession. <coughs> uh, well, these are all model generated results. So they're based very largely on the kinds of choices that we make today. Because the way these models work is that unless you have a good reason for changing the assumption that uh, the way the economy works, you, you tend to let it go on doing what it does. Some of the changes you put into the model on purpose, so a lot of the low carbon technologies, which obviously didn't exist 20 years ago, get put into the model on our best estimates of the model of the costs of those. But with things like education, health spending, and social care, so those are three of the big public services, we more or less think that populations, certain populations require those sorts of levels of expenditure and indeed will choose those levels of expenditure as they get richer, because these are all societies getting richer. Um, and there is broad convergence over the century between countries that are currently very poor and countries that are much richer. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Did you mention cost? Sorry, we wouldn't have a QA because it's a question after the next one. But if you don't have the patient actually that you have to get it. And you did mention cost, so maybe not a perspective. What came into my mind about the cost in general in the county, which is the most valuable thing, the fact that you have mentioned that it's linked to that. Is Shall I repeat the question? It's a very, very important question, so thank you very much. And it's one that I come across a lot, which is that given the finite nature of the planet, and given the pressures that it's currently under, do we need to temper our current pursuit of economic growth uh, going forward? And my answer to it um, is, as with everything from academics, I want to know what you mean by growth. What is growing? Is it money that is growing, which is GDP? Is it money that is growing, or is it environmental impact and the use of physical resources. Well, yeah, but the thing is that the relationship between those two is not constant. And we can see in the data that it has changed dramatically over time. For example, we used to burn fossil fuels in such a way that we released a lot of sulfur dioxide. And you will remember in the 1980s, there was a huge excitement about acid rain and all that stuff. We then put technologies in place that stopped those emissions of sulfur dioxide. So even as we continued to increase the use of fossil fuels, emissions of sulfur dioxide fell by 90% in the in Germany, in the UK, in other European. Total impact and material use and money incomes is variable. And it can be changed by policy. So my answer to your question is, if by growth, you mean the growth of the use of material resources and the growth of environmental impact, absolutely that has to not only stop, it has to reduce dramatically, just as with CO2 emissions. What my argument is that that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to reduce incomes. The incomes may continue to grow. We will spend them on different things, because the environmentally damaging expenditures will be much more expensive. And that therefore means we will be richer, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna be able to do much more of everything that we may want to do. We will be able to do much more of things that don't damage the environment. And uh, that's, I guess, the answer to the question. Have they? Well, I spoke, I spoke earlier about um, our speakers in this session 
putting us into the, the larger picture. Each, each of the small components of our jigsaw puzzle, which I put forward as an idea, um, are coming together. And what we're hearing is that if we follow certain disciplines, there is a place for us in that picture of the future. Um, if I can just make a short story about the past, because um, Paul did mention the Industrial Revolution. And there are some here, Paul, who will remember our annual conference some years back held in Telford, close to Iron Bridge. And we went out in that final night to the local school named after Abraham Darby. And that was why I was checking my, own, my mobile, you'll like to know. Um, and Abraham Darby was credited with actually saying, I can make pig iron from uh, heat from coke rather than charcoal. And there was the start of the Industrial Revolution in that valley, we always argue. And um, the Abraham Darby School had a most fantastic swing orchestra. I, I can't believe they were so good. And um, some of you here will remember. And I stood up and said, you cannot believe it. This is so important. These are the children of the people who started the Industrial Revolution. I was quite overcome by it. And then expansively, I switched home to the orchestra. <laughs> and it was like one of those typical schools up there who rejoice in having 100 languages amongst them. <laughs> Very few of them really came from the valley. They came from all parts of the world. But in a way, we're influenced by that same Industrial Revolution all those 200 years prior. So, you know, the cause and effect of, of, of um, affects society in so many ways. And I guess the forests were relieved. They were no longer broken down in such great numbers for the charcoal, but that's a different story. When we move to the second of our speakers, putting us in the big picture, uh, Professor Sir Dieter Helm, and the talk is titled Net Zero, How to Make It Happen. So Suhail has, has, has written so elegantly, 26 COPs have not led to a dent in the annual increase of carbon in the atmosphere of two parts per million every year since 1990. We've heard that phrase. A key reason is that the COPs have set territorial carbon production targets, ignoring carbon consumption. They have also largely neglected the other half of the climate change problem, natural sequestration, or shall I say the contribution of natural sequestration. This presentation will set out how to define carbon consumption net zero targets, how to make polluters pay, the role of carbon prices, taxes and border adjustments, and what needs to be done to halt the damage to the national environment, natural environment, and its capacity to absorb carbon. It will set out what you personally need to do to contribute to this decarbonizing transition. So, Dieter Helm. One second, please.
Can you hear it? Most people now understand that it's not the law. It's given to increase the participation of the agency. You can't allow two, three, four, five, six degrees all in the same place. And we can't go on with what it is now one of the great distinction moments in the geological history for why the United society. And it's not just that it evolved to do this damage to our planet, it's that our whole existence depends upon nature uh, and the climate. And the earth in its unique way probably is able to provide the kind of background that we have to wish for prosperity, to thrive in this world, and to have a living in this world. So I think almost everyone understands the full scale of the challenge. In a way, when I was young, people uh, didn't really engage with the idea that it could be this kind of thing. And net zero is one of the ways in which uh, this has been encapsulated as a uh, ambition, a target, uh, and thus the world is begun to organize itself around. The idea that net zero is where we should go. Now, there are some problems with this rather neat encapsulation of our environmental problems. The one is that um, this is the cost of us necessarily to do good things to match the environment. We need to do both, and not just one. But there's something much more fundamental. See, most people I think believe that if we get to that zero, at that point we will no longer be putting climate change. And that if we get to that zero, then climate change will effectively be taken to the sky. The deep idea, a very exciting, the one that is going true, but it turned out not to be true, it isn't enough to do that zero. And just to be net zero is a huge problem in its own right, and we have to have a full environment to say. So let me explain to you what net zero really means and why it's not enough in its current right. So the first thing to understand is what climate change is and what causes climate change. Well, I don't think she knows that she's still up, uh, but it's a little bit more complex. The net zero is all about our emissions of carbon that we're putting up in the atmosphere. It's not directly about how much carbon there is in the atmosphere. So, before the time of change, the greenhouse effect is well known as the Grand Street in the 19th century. Is about those concentrations, those spots of gases in our atmosphere, of which carbon is one of the four greenhouse gases. I'm not talking about carbon uh, today, um, but just say that it's a kind of time close to the greenhouse gases in general. But it's a stop, and there's a flow into the atmosphere from our emissions. But there's a flow out of the atmosphere through sequestration. The natural world is concerned about carbon for uh, as long as the natural world existed. Indeed, our entire natural world is carbon based. Trees, plants, you and me are the substantial degree lumps of carbon. So our natural world. Rainforests, our trees, our uh, grasslands, vegetation, but especially the oceans, have spent millennia keeping the balance of our uh, soft carbon in the atmosphere by taking out what's being put up. And by the way, there's a lot of carbon we put up through natural processes, not just through uh, human emissions that are down to the so, my idea 
situations happen with what it was, that would be the day we turn through the news. We can't have to stop the world going together and push it down at what it might want. But we would be doing it. But it wasn't enough compensating and concentrating on the silver now. The reason for that are twofold. First is, there will not be really measuring all the issues. And that leads to the second one. But while we are polluting out the sea emissions, we're destroying the natural world of ability to see the strength and absorb that problem. These things do it together in one particular dimension, and that's agriculture. Soils, the basic of agriculture, have roughly four times as much carbon as the atmosphere. If you have an ask, Lots of carbon are there. The answer to lots of carbon in the soils are the main deposit of the atom. And what we do is take the carbon deposits in the soils and the old gas in the coal and deposit and put them out of the ground in the atmosphere. Agriculture, modern agriculture, is particularly good at stripping carbon out of the soil. But it's a deep solution. They are not the answer, and they are not capturing the problem. The debt of agriculture is one of the kind of accessible issues. Um, it's developed, I think, in advance because um, we have been in 2072 billion and 10 billion, and the world will have been 9 billion. So, we have to look at how uh, agriculture stops the emitting carbon from the soils. And it said, so it's enough. That requires massive agricultural evolution. But if we're given the so many people in the world population, one will be looking for more meat and a way from the sea of ice dioxide to the many people who put so many in their own pockets. So we have to look for agriculture. And we have to look for some issue that our natural environment is really good at continuing to soak up. And here, there is one piece of news from last year, which I think should be absolutely reminder that when we think about climate change, we really do have to think about the country environment of the day. Last year, the analysts were paying a net billion dollar cost. Just let that sink in. So, this is one of the great photographies of the world, it's one of the greatest reservoirs. And we have done so much damage to it, our students, that we now no longer on balance of the carbon fuel. And in the process of the Royal Science, which are now annual rates, not just in Canada, but in Asia, other Western forests, etc., um, we are um, damaging the other side of the climate change. On one side, sequestration of the We need to do both. We need to reduce those emissions and we need to increase that sequestration. And in one reason the way for a lot of climate change, you're right. The whole supposed that in my personal view, no chance of stopping. Uh, Now, don't think that this actual kind of 
So we'll have some Q&A with uh, the panel discussion, Tricia, uh, Professor Eakins, uh, John, do you want to come over? We'll have some Q&A, uh, about 15 minutes. Yeah. I'll bring the laptop over. The uh, connected to Zoom. Yes, it, it will be connected. But I don't need the uh, the screen. Thank you. 
Yes, I wouldn't say so much a disagreement. What I would say is a, a different emphasis. So what Dieter did not tell you was that at least 23 countries, including the UK, are reducing their consumption emissions as well as their territorial emissions. And this is a new development so that over the years from 2000 to about 2010, it was indeed the case that if you calculate the UK emissions on the basis of the territory emissions, we were indeed substituting uh, carbon intensive consumption made in the UK for carbon intensive imports, mainly from China, which was uh, growing at an enormous speed in a very carbon intensive way. And you can see that in the data. But since about 2010, that is no longer the case. And we are now reducing both our production emissions and our consumption emissions at more or less the same rate. The other thing he didn't say is that the actual calculation of consumption emissions is really difficult, which is why that's not how they do it in the Climate Change Convention, because you have to have these very complicated multi-region input output models, which will tell you what the carbon emissions of a car made in China are, given that there are lots of car factories in China and they all have slightly different processes and some use renewable energy and some use coal-fired energy, you can see that those differences are extraordinarily difficult to compute with any sort of accuracy at all. So broadly, data is right, that it is consumption emissions that count. And of course, if you count consumption emissions, it does mean that we count all our import emissions or as far as they can be calculated, but we can then subtract all our export emissions. And similarly, China subtracts its export emissions around the world and add its emissions from imports so that we get the same aggregate total number of emissions globally, 
because exports plus imports must cancel out across the world as a whole. But so the, the picture uh, is not quite as bad as Dieter said. And although I'm absolutely no fan of this government, it is the case that the UK compared with other countries is a climate change leader. We were the first country to put in place a climate change act, which has been enormously important with a climate change committee with five yearly budgets leading to net zero in, um, uh, in 2050 and our progress in decarbonizing our electricity system through the kind of offshore wind farms that I was talking about in my lecture has been quite dramatic. So there are now times when we do uh, have 30 to 40% of uh, zero carbon energy on our grid, which compared with only 10 years ago is, is a dramatic change. Is it enough? No, of course it is. Do we need to do much more? Yes, of course we do. But actually, over the last...
and, and how can we encourage other countries to, to do this now? Is this a, something that should happen on the UN framework or is it something for campaigners in different countries? How can we make more countries get engaged with this? If this seems to be a really important mechanism. <clears throat> well, it is really important. And the beauty of it, in a sense, is that um, I'm not sure that we would need to make them because they will all have the financial incentive to do it. They all want to import uh, export their goods to Europe because it's one of the biggest markets in the world. They all want to export and they will not want to pay these carbon tariffs. You can expect to challenge the World Trade Organization, obviously, because this is uh, a tariff based on process and production measures. But lawyers much cleverer than I am have suggested that it is actually carbon, that it would be compliant with the WTO. So I think this will come in. I think there'll be a lot of, obviously China loathes it at the moment, but I think China will come around to it because uh, it, it has not been, well, it has been more supportive of carbon measures uh, than many other countries. And so I think um, we will see it over the course of the next four or five years. As I say, too slow, too little, too late, but better than nothing. And is it partly a capacity building thing? Is it something that's quite complex for low income countries to do? And they need some support in, in introducing this? Uh, well, what they need to do is introduce their own carbon taxes. That's what they need to do. And yes, they do need support in that. I went out to Indonesia to advise the Ministry of Finance there on them introducing a carbon tax, which they have subsequently done. Not enough, not big enough, not 80 euros a ton of carbon. So they will have to pay a tariff when this carbon border adjustment mechanism comes in, but they will have the administration in place. They will have the people in the Ministry of Finance who understand how to do it, and they will then be able to uh, crank it up. And they will be able to apply it to the other part that Dieter was talking about, which was the deforestation. It will apply to the palm oil foundation, the palm oil plantations that are replacing the tropical forests in uh, in, in Indonesia. So, so yes, it's potentially a very powerful mechanism. And from what you say, this carbon border adjustment mechanism isn't introduced yet. Is there a date when it's due to be introduced? I think the European Commission wants to introduce it uh, in the EU during the lifetime of this commission. And this commission only has another couple of years to run. So uh, everything to do with this green deal uh, at the European level is really on a fast track. And I think we will therefore see it before this commission um, comes to an end. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Um, so, Hale, could you take my microphone? Sorry. Thank you so much. I think this one's done one work. I was just here. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's yes, don't adjust anything because oh, okay. it was working just uh, me. Two questions, one domestic and one international. Um, in the 1970s, when Great Britain was Minister of Energy, he was negotiating the contract for the oil industry and realized there was a large sum of money coming into the Treasury. And he put aside 500 million pounds a year for eight loss service. We used to do this with aircraft. We could fly the whole of Birmingham from one to the east of morning and identify all the heat loss from the whole of Birmingham in one hour. When we fashion won the next election, and the first thing she said was, can't do all that. It's up to the individual householder to decide if they are losing heat loss or not. In the 1990s, there was a conference. On the problem of the European oil. And one of the speakers was the Professor Hilton Parliament from the Fields Oxford University. And she said for 10 years they've been trying to improve the insulation standards of British Airways. And it had been rejected every single time by the building industry because of the extra cost. You know, in half of them, properties gone from three thousand pounds to a twenty-two thousand house in nineteen sixty to probably three hundred thousand pounds a year. But now we've got the British, you look at Johnson's ex-government, they can't get houses insulated. So my question is, how is this government ever going to get the building industry to do what it wants to cut down our demand for 
international questions uh, related to this emphasis we have on the power of the Ukraine. My son lives in Cornwall and he has a power. To get from Cornwall to here, he needs at least six hours on his mobile phone to identify where he can find a child. Of course, stop the estimate between Cornwall and here as an hour and a half of the return. I worked in Nigeria. The roads are a thousand miles long. They don't have an electricity supply that is reliable for more than two hours a day in Melbourne. So, how is Africa going to survive if you are denied the access to oil and knowledge can't? Because I can't see how we're going to have e car chargers all the way every hundred miles across the Sahara from all the long distance travel. The two big problems. Thank you very much. So the question was first about how we can uh, encourage uh, builders to better insulate homes and, and carry through what uh, Tony Ben tried to do all those years ago. And the second question was about um, energy, uh, electric cars in Nigeria. And I'm just going to chip in with something on that second one, because I remember when I lived in Nigeria, I used to worry about how they would ever get their telephones to everyone and, this, and electricity to everyone and go through all the stages that we'd been through in getting to where we were. Of course, they didn't, they piggybacked. So now they have mobile phones everywhere and they have a phone to do electric lights and they have a lot of solar power and wind power everywhere. So my hope is maybe they will have, you know, solar electric cars that are uh, charging as they drive along with solar panels on the roof, you know, and all that. So I just think there might be ways of piggybacking the technology rather than going through the same things we've been through. But let me hand it over for Paul, who knows much more about this than me. Well, I was going to hand over the electric cars to, um, to in, in Nigeria, at least to John. Um, but I'll, I'll pick up the building one because you put your finger on a really, really important point. Um, the building industry in this country is an absolute disgrace. Uh, and they have indeed been very, very uh, obstructive. Uh, I mean, most recently, there was the, the net zero homes. Do you remember that was something from the Blair government in 2006, where they gave 10 years to the building industry to build nothing but zero carbon homes. And I know for a fact, several building construction companies regarded that as a huge competitive opportunity. They invested heavily in the technology of how to do that. And then in 2015, because of lobbying from the building industry, George Osborne canceled that policy. Nine years into a 10 year program, the building industry, those construction firms will never believe a word that the government says ever again, because they wasted hundreds of millions of pounds preparing for a policy over 10 years, which was then pulled right from under them. And that was a direct result of lobbying from the volume house. Business. So we've simply got to get those guys under control. The other way, the other thing that's gone wrong is that we no longer fund local authorities to inspect new building. All the building inspectors are paid for by the building industry, not by the local authorities. And they don't bother with energy efficiency. With the result that although the building standards have improved dramatically over the last 25 years, the houses that have been built have not. Because if you're not going to be inspected, you're not going to follow the rules and regulations. I mean, that's, that's the number one principle of public policy. So the government has a lot of responsibility for the fact that our new homes do not even meet the building regulations that are on the statute book. And of course, those are not uh, stringent enough. So what do we do going forward? That has to be two major policy initiatives. And the current energy prices help with this. There has to be a financial facility that will help the able to pay market, the people like me who can afford to build, to have their homes well insulated, to borrow the money and pay it back out of the savings. And we kind of did a bit of that in the Green Deal uh, in, the, in the David Cameron government, but they got the numbers wrong and it didn't work. 
And I wasn't surprised because I was on the advisory panel and I told them that they got the numbers wrong. And I told them that it wouldn't work because they were wanting to make loans at 7% to householders when they could get a mortgage for 3%. So, I mean, it wasn't rocket science. Um, so they just got it wrong, but they had the right idea. And then the other sector are the people, the private rented sector, where we need a combination of regulation so that these buy to rent homes are brought up in energy efficiency, combined with rent controls, so that the landlords go, don't go over the top and just pull all the rents up, which is all the evidence suggests that they will. These are big political, big political initiatives that take a lot of courage and a lot of political capital. And ministers have had their fingers very badly burnt over the last few years. So I'm not, uh, I'm not holding my breath, uh, waiting for them to happen, but they absolutely need to happen. And at some point, hopefully, we'll get a government that will make them happen. Um, and we're, uh, it's not gonna happen this summer, I'm afraid. So that's the one firm prediction I will make. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for the questions. Um, Oxfam is neither expert in home insulation nor <laughs> electric cars, but I'll say something about those questions. I think, first of all, one point that you alluded to in your question, which is really important, is alongside the economics, there's also the sort of cultural economics of consumption. Um, the 1970s, which was probably about as big as the turning point in home insulation plans that Tony Benn brought in at the time. We then saw the neoliberal turn in the late 1970s and the development of a culture for individual consumption. And so the neoliberal turn became, I, I guess, the dominant element of our culture. So all these consumption questions, whether it's flying around the world or driving an SUV or buying clothing imported from China or whatever it is, this is all more a matter of individual choice, which is seen as being part of our democratic freedoms now, and I think requires a big cultural shift as well as a shift in economics and um, production to change. And uh, that's I worry about that cultural issue as well um, a lot. John, John, do you want to? Do yeah, okay. Angle it. Okay, yeah. with, with, with respect to. Um, transport in lower income countries. So I have experience of Nigeria and many other countries in, in West Africa. And I know that we're stuck on the third mainland bridge in, um, in Lagos. There's an awful lot of traffic around you at that time. But really, public transport cars in Africa are not the big problem. If you're outside the city, and when I worked in Sierra Leone for a while, I had a place when I was working inside the main road one or two cars would pass in a day. So their consumption and their emissions were low compared with a European or European country. Um, however, in, um, in many African countries and also around the world, public transport strikes me as incredibly inefficient. You know, in, in Nigeria, it's either by sitting on the back of a motorbike, or being a passenger in a shared taxi, like a Persian car. Um, so more carbon efficient transport just is very rare in the world. And I know that Lagos has been building a metro recently, and Nigeria has reopened some of its railways. Um, so there are other more efficient ways, not even getting towards electric cars, just yet where the charging points would be. Near, nearest electric car charging point to my own house, about two kilometers away. So um, I'm a little bit from having an electric car, well, I don't have a car, but I would be able to have an electric car just because of the problems you suggested. But within, within countries in Africa, there are many things that can be done before that to make transport more carbon efficient. And I, you know, look at a city like Johannesburg. With the, um, the mass transit system, with one in Bogota in Colombia as well, which can move lots of people around in very efficient, sort of stretchy buses that are much more efficient than, say, having 10 minibus taxis or 40 motorbikes to, to do the same job. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So, okay, Andrew, um, so could you take the microphone to Andrew, please? Thank you. Oh, I really wish you hadn't made this the last question because um, I uh, I can't even say how much I'm going to keep myself after this because I'm going to stand up to the current government. Um, but as of the 15th of June this year, building regulations and the insulation new homes went up considerably, and any home built after that date now has to have a huge insulation value. All homes in this country for the last probably 10 years have had pressure testing to ensure that they don't waste energy. I'm not saying they were well put together, but they physically have to pass an on site test in order to get a certificate. And you buy a new home, you get a copy of it. Every new home from the 15th of June built this year will have a charging point in the house, in the garage, or on the or in the house. So I hate to say it, but they've done they've done something. Um, so it's not all perhaps bad news don't think. The bad news is that only applies to new homes. 90% of our stock are old homes, and none of those are going to have charging points, high levels of insulation, pressure testing. They're the ones that need to come up to stand because they can be years. Thank you. Thank you. So Andrew just mentioned um, some changes that came on the 15th of June. The new homes have to be better insulated. They have to have um, charging points for electric vehicles. And I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. Well, just to say that I think it's really important to acknowledge changes, good changes when they take place, as you've just done. And um, uh, we'll have to make sure those homes are properly inspected so that the, build is, the builders do deliver on that in a way that they haven't always in the past. And, um, uh, you know, I'm in a faculty of the built environment at UCL. So uh, a lot of my colleagues have been kind of monitoring all these things in the past. But no, the message is getting through and some policies are being put in place and they do make a difference. We do need to ensure that they are enforced. That takes money, that takes political will. And I think they will need to be enforced by local authorities and local authorities will need to be resourced in order to do that effectively. Um, and I'm not yet sure that that aspect of it is properly in place, but I very much hope it is and that um, the optimism that you expressed in your... Uh, it's it, always optimistic. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, let's hope that they're going to be enforced. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you for your interesting questions. And I'm sure you'd like to join with me. And thank you very much, Paul Ekins and John McCarthy for that. <laughs>
groups everywhere in the country, but it's not just a Westminster story. And that is that um, about five or six years ago, we just felt that London ought, like other great cities, have somewhere which is associated by name with the United Nations. And we looked around the city for all sorts of places until we realized, oh, after so much time, the answer was right underneath our nose. In front of the QE2 center, um, there's a triangular piece of grass, which in fact was the creation of the architect of the QE2 center, which had been given a name in 1970s. And it faces Westminster Abbey, but even better, it faces Westminster Central Hall, Methodist Central Hall, where, as we all know, the UN first met in January the 10th, 1946. So we approached the Foreign Office and said, well, let's call this um, United Nations Green. And the Foreign Office, after a while, said, well, I suppose, oh, why not? I mean, it was so difficult to get any decision, but in the end, they agreed. And then a bombshell hit us that it was decided that the House of Lords would be uh, decanted to the QE2 Centre, and this would make uh, lead to an 18-foot wire fence around UN Green, making it impossible for access for 30 years, and um, that was the end of that story. But we pressed on and pressed on and pressed on, and eventually in discussions with the House of Lords authorities, they relented and said, no, we're not going to put a big fence around it. Yes, we will not interfere with the geographic integrity of the green. Um, as far as we're concerned, you can go ahead. Then led to indecision by government, but um, it wasn't totally unexpected, but it was a lovely surprise on the morning of January the 10th, 2021, exactly 75 years after the opening of the General Assembly, the, the news at eight o'clock in the morning said the naming was confirmed. And that very same day, um, we had a joint service at Methodist Central Hall, which I was introducing. And you can imagine what thrill it was for me to announce to the world this great thing. So I was um, quite excited that I could ring, contact Google Maps the next day and to say, I want you to rename this piece of grass. And I was so amused that the question, they came back with two questions. Are you the owner? Yes, no. <laughs> what are your opening hours? <laughs> and as anybody in this room would say, yes, and 24 seven, which is where it stands. So I'm now informed every month, how many people have visited your green? And the answer is so far 486,000. Now, next Sunday, and this is the point, um, we're having our second birthday party on your green. Um, there will be a steel pans player. If you want to bring kids and try limbo dancing, we're releasing peace doves. There will be somewhere to drink, oh, well, coffee and tea. And we will have our great display, the world's largest UN 75 display of all the maps, all the, all the flags of the world and other things too. But it's just at the one time in the year we can actually take position, possession of your United Nations green. You can learn more about it on unitednationsgreen.uk. We've created a website for it. And there it is. Remember, <coughs> whenever you pass through that part of London, that bit is yours. Go on up to it, stamp on it, shout, United Nations, this is us. We're from Harvard and we're from Streatham. Well, not the people from Streatham, but the people, but the people from Richmond. <laughs> so really, that's it. Next, next Sunday, between 1 and 5, we'll be there. Different... Um, embassies are sending people to plant their own flag and people are walking from Man Nelson Mandela's bust at South Bank Centre to his statue in nearby Parliament Square, which we worked out is exactly a mile. So we called it the Mandela Mile and that Mandela Mile idea has been taken up by cities throughout the world on his birthday, which is the following day, Monday, um, which is Nelson Mandela Day. So people will be walking along and collecting their Mandela badges, generally making the place look busy if it doesn't rain. So there you go, as it did last year. <laughs> Thank you. So yet another update. It's amazing initiatives. Next Sunday, do join in the Mandela Mile and the uh, party on UN Green. Are there any other announcements from any other UN branches, UN branches here today?
Okay, so here. Just one announcement on 30th of July, um, a councillor from the uh, Chinese embassy is going to talk about President Xi Jinping's security initiative by Zoom. If anyone wants to listen. Thank you very much. So that's the 30th of July, another hot and great event. Congratulations. And now I'm sure you'd all like to join with me in thanking UNA Harbinger for their excellent arrangements today. I want to thank Tony, Trevor, David, all the many members of the uh, team that has worked hard today. I think they've done a splendid day, right from the flag out on the road to the signs as we came in to the whole organization of the room. It's been a huge job. I think so Hale started working on it in about January and it's put together an outstanding group of speakers, two of them are still here, but I think we have just been so privileged in the expertise and uh, uh, erudition that we have heard today, so I thank you, congratulations to help, congratulations Harbinger, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, John. No, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you so much